All right, I'm gonna start this video off with a question. What would you call this kind of table? On our podcast, I described it as an eating table and Mike found that to be very amusing. Chow's an table. eating table, as opposed to what, Chris? Yeah. An eating table, well, I, AKA I, dining table. I, I, you. Now, my thinking was when I say a dining table, I picture a larger, more formal table, whereas this I think of as something that could go in a family room or a kitchen nook. I don't know. So let me know in the comments if you've got an idea. But regardless of what we call it, it's gonna be a standard height, 48 inch round table. And actually the way that this one came to be is a little different. Long story short, a potential client contacted me and said that they wanted a bar height table, which is typically 40 to 42 inches tall. So I drew up this and then they backed out. But I really liked the design, and even though I didn't personally have a need or know anybody who wanted this kind of table, I was really excited about the build. So I just assumed that I'd start building it and then figure out what to do with it later. Funding for Forest Furniture is provided in part by supporters on Patreon. If you want to find out how you can support the show, check out the link in the description. So one of the unique things about this project, at least for me, is that historically whenever I build a piece like this, I would limit the thickness of the base pieces to whatever I could get out of one piece of wood. So if I'm using eight quarter material, for example, the thickest that I'm probably gonna end up with is about one and three quarters of an inch. For this one though, I really wanted to try a chunkier leg in terms of its thickness. So the first thing that I had to do was cut up a bunch of eight quarter material and partially mill it and then laminate the pieces together in pairs so that I could essentially create what would become three inch thick pieces of wood after their final milling. And as you're gonna see, while we work our way through this build, this actually presented quite a few, I won't call them problems, but maybe obstacles, which I'll talk about as they come up. And the first obstacle, or I guess maybe concern, was what the edges of the legs would look like. So in an ideal world, the pieces will end up looking like one thick chunk of wood and not two thinner pieces that are glued together. It's gonna to be the moment of truth to see, uh, did I, will I have to try to like disguise that seam or is it gonna be camouflaged enough naturally? And I will know right now. Actually, I probably won't know because it's gonna be covered in glue. Oh, that's great, that's fantastic. It's a stalagmite, tights are from the ceiling. Tights are from this. That's the a tight. Mites are from the ground. That's a mite. They're mighty. Yeah, if they all come out like this, by the time I get it all worked and sanded and cleaned up and everything, I think this will be fine. So I'm happy with that, but this is only one of six pieces that hopefully worked out. Um, so I'll go through the rest of them and then I'll take it from there. All right, at this point, I've got my eight blanks all milled to size and I can start turning them into furniture pieces. And what they're gonna become are four legs, two top stretchers, and two bottom stretchers. And to help me do that, I'm gonna make use of these three template pieces. Now, if you wanna build this piece too, we're gonna be making a full set of plans, but actually this one's gonna be slightly different in three ways. First, in addition to covering every detail exactly the way that I did it, I'm gonna cover a simpler version where the base pieces are only about an inch and a half thick, which will significantly simplify this build. Second, we're gonna provide additional options for a counter height version. And third is that from now until the plan is officially released, we're gonna be doing a $20 pre-sale discount. And then once it comes out, it'll go up to the normal price and stay there. Otherwise though, this will be exactly like the rest of our plans. So if you're interested in building this project or any of our others, definitely check out the plans and I'll have a link in the description. So after tracing my template shapes onto my pieces and very crudely cutting them out on the bandsaw, next I could get to work on cutting my joint faces. But to make sure this works, I need to have at least one flat edge on each of my work pieces. On my leg pieces and my top stretcher, I already have these edges, which were created when we milled our blanks. But on my lower stretcher, I don't have a good reference face 
So first I'm gonna attach my template to my workpiece and use a templating bit and a flush trim bit to clear out this center portion of the stretcher so that I can use that as my reference face. Okay, to cut the joint faces, I like to do it by setting up a quick little slut. And normally this is a really quick and easy thing to do. Basically you cut a piece of plywood to size, leave your table saw's fence locked in that position, and then use a few more pieces of plywood as fences along with your templates to create a situation where you can accurately and repeatedly cut the joint faces on your piece. But if you're building the three inch thick version of the piece, you're gonna run into an obstacle here or at least I did. And that is that the highest my blade can go above my tabletop, so the thickest piece that I can possibly cut through in one pass is three inches, which wouldn't be a problem, except that the plywood sled the piece is riding on raises it up another three quarters of an inch. So the most obvious solution would be just lose the sled. You could probably use your miter gauge referencing your template against the side of your blade and locking it in position and making your cut that way. You could also make most of these cuts on a miter saw. In fact, I cut the tops of my legs as you can see here this way. But since my setup isn't super accurate, I left them about a sixteenth of an inch longer than they needed to be and then we'll clean them up later. And this is okay because this is a much less crucial cut since it's not a joint face. It's just kind of where the piece ends. All that said, while you could cut these joint faces on a miter saw, you couldn't cut these. Well, maybe this one though it would be a pretty bad way to go about it, but certainly not this one. But anyway, I wanted to stick with my sled technique, so what I did was go about my setup like normal, and then made my cut through the... ...75% of the piece that my blade could touch. After doing that to all of my pieces, I went back over to my bandsaw and cleared out the rest of the cut by cutting through the kerf mark that was left in my piece, airing on the side of the off cut. So that I was basically left with this little ridge that's only about a sixteenth of an inch proud of the rest of the joint face. Then from there, I used a flush trim bit, and you could do this with a router table or a handheld router, and removed the last little bit of the joint face. And while you could technically finish off all of your pieces this way, I didn't, and that's because the stretchers are gonna be end grain. And routing end grain, even on a little piece like this, is not a good idea. And that's because you're probably gonna get some tear out, and with this being the joint face, this is kind of the last place that you wanna have tear out, not to mention it's just dangerous. So to clear out the rest of the material on those pieces, I used my miter gauge to set the proper angle, and then just kind of nibbled away, checking after each cut, until I felt like I had a nice coplanar face. Now, here's the good news. If you like the thinner version of the base, then none of this stuff is even necessary. You just go about your sled setup, make your cut on the table saw, and you're good to go. All right, so with the joint faces cut, next we can put our base subassemblies together, and because each of these joints is partially end grain, I would recommend using something to reinforce the joint, whether that's dowels, dominoes, beadlock tenons, biscuits, or whatever you have access to. And you'll also want to use some sort of clamping blocks to help get pressure in the right spot. In the plans, we provide dimensions for these that you can make out of plywood. And the only other thing that I need to pay attention to is making sure that the top of my leg sits slightly proud of the top of my stretcher. Because remember, when I cut that on the miter saw, I left them slightly too long. Okay, while those are drying, let's turn our attention to the top for a minute. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is start cutting it into some chunks to make our round tabletop, 48 inch circular top. So in the center, you need to get a board longer than 48 inches, obviously, but then you don't want to like build a 48 by 48 square and then cut a circle because that would be wasteful. So you can kind of like make it stair step so that it gets shorter and shorter as it gets to the sides. Does that make sense to you? As you go out to the sides, how much shorter do you think you can get with those boards? So you have the number, so you know this already. I know this. 40 inches. Okay, and then the two shortest, so the ones on the very ends. 25. Okay, so 
you go 50, 50, 50, 46 inches. So you barely lose anything. Like you're not really saving that much material like you would think you were. Then the two small ones, 38 inches. I can't think of any songs that the band A Perfect Circle did, so I can't do a pun there. But I will say that in order to make it, I'm gonna use my tools. All right, while we get the top milled and glued together, let's take a second to thank Simply Safe for sponsoring this video. So Simply Safe makes home security systems that are easy to set up and intuitive to use and make sure that your home is safe. And they do this by covering your home comprehensively, both inside and out, thanks to products like their video doorbell, glass break sensors, and everything else that they offer. So after you design your system, it gets delivered right to your door, and it's really easy to set up yourself. And from there, your home's being professionally monitored 24 seven. And if anything ever happens, they're always on team will call authorities immediately. And Simply Safe's interactive monitoring service begins at only 50 cents per day. We've had our system for over two years now, starting off with window and door sensors, glass break sensors, cameras, and the basics, and have since expanded to include the video doorbell, and most recently, their new wireless outdoor security camera. And this thing's slick. Super easy to install, has a huge 140 degree field of view, plus eight times zoom, and a built-in spotlight with color night vision and two-way audio, so you can communicate through it and keep an eye on everything around the clock. So if you've been thinking about getting a home security system, or even if you have a system that you think could be better, you owe it to yourself to give Simply Safe a look. There's no contract, no hidden fees, and right now you can get at least 30% off of your system with interactive monitoring service, which will call the police if it's ever alerted to anything. So visit the URL that you see on screen here, or better yet, just click the link in the description and put a system together and see if it's right for you. Okay, thanks Simply Safe. All right, so here I've got my tabletop flipped upside down and I'm finding the center of my center board. Then I could drill a small pilot hole that my circle cutting jigs pin would fit into, which I could use to draw a circle that represents the finished size that I want for my top. And that's when the inspector decided to drop in. Anyway, from there I used my jigsaw to remove most of the material and then set my jig up at the proper dimension and took several laps to route out the circle shape. Okay, back over at the legs, which are dry now, you'll remember that all we've template routed at this point was this little portion of the lower stretcher. So now we're gonna attach all three of our templates to the base and then we can finalize the shape. And here again, it's gonna be a combination of a templating bit and a flush trim bit. And you can do the entire thing with a handheld router or use a router table. And the only trick here is that I like to leave this little bit where the faces meet unrouted. You could route the transition if you want, but it's likely that you're gonna get a small amount of tear out. So instead I'll leave the extra material and then use a spindle sander to finish the transition. We don't have a spindle sander. Go look under the CNC. Anyway, then I used this setup, which you could replicate for about $2,084.48. So that's $176.48 for the actual spindle sander, and then $1,938 for the stuff that I used to make sure that the base was properly supported and that the dust got collected. Not counting tax. With that all looking good, next we could finalize the overall height of our table. And you can do this with either a track saw, a circular saw and a guide, or a table saw like I'm doing. And where you make this cut is going to be up to whatever you prefer. So typically a standard height or dining table is going to be anywhere from about 28 to 30 inches tall. So the leg templates that we'll give you the file for, or physically mail to you, are left purposefully long. If you were to cut your feet where the template ends, you'd end up with a table 30 inches plus the thickness of your top high. But as you can see in this shot, the workflow that you use to make the pieces leaves your legs a little bit longer than that. So I personally cut mine to 28 and a half inches, but you can see that my off cuts a good three inches or so. Okay, at this point, we've got our two leg subassemblies that we need to turn into one base. And again, there's lots of ways you could approach this. 
but I decided that by far the easiest way to do this was by marking the thickness of one of my subassemblies on the center of the other, and then removing that material and gluing the entire thing back together. To make that cut, you could do this a bunch of different ways, but I decided to use my Craig ACS. And then to put everything together, I actually used two methods. Now, I would recommend just doing one, but I wanted to illustrate the options for the plans. So one of the legs I attached with pocket hole screws, and these will be essentially invisible since the pocket holes on the top will get concealed by the tabletop, and the ones on the bottom will be on the underside of the stretcher, which is only about five inches off the ground. But anyway, then for the other, I used some dominoes. That said, again, dowels or any other sort of floating tenon type joinery system out there could be substituted. All right, while that's drying, I'm gonna put a few optional edge details on our top. And that's gonna consist of a small round over on the top edge to make resting forearms more comfortable and a small chamfer on the underside. And together, those two details will look like this. That said, again, they're optional, so you could do anything that you like or nothing at all. And then it was time to work on what for me was probably the hardest part of this entire build, and that was attaching the base to the top. So in the plans, we'll cover a bunch of different ways that you can do this, but I decided to do it the hardest of the ways that we covered, which consists of threaded inserts in the tabletop and then mortising in some elongated washers on the underside of the top stretcher. And I go over this in a ton of detail to make sure that you can get the job done no problem. That said, this was definitely overkill. And we show a really simple way that you can achieve the same thing, accounting for the potential of wood movement, with just a drill, a Forstner bit, and some regular washers. Hey, real quick, I always avoid asking people to hit the subscribe button. I figure that you're aware of it, and if you like the videos, you'll do it. But I'm gonna try it out, so smash the like button or hit it, or whatever you like to do it. Just click it, you can be soft, I don't judge. Next, I started working on an optional edge detail for the leg, which was probably the most disappointing part of the build for me. Long story short, I wanted to use this edge detail that we always describe as a thumbnail profile, and that's where it's kind of round on the back edge, but still has a nice crisp edge on the face. And the way that we cut this is with a normal round over bit. So if you're doing the thinner leg version, it's really simple to get this sort of shape on your leg, but with the thicker version, the roundover bit would have to be gigantic in order to get a nice smooth arc like this. So instead, I ended up with a large flat spot on the back, but at least I was still able to get a nice crisp line on the face, so while it's a little disappointing, I'm still pretty happy with the effect that it gives. While I'm putting the finishing touches on this dining, eating, whatever table, I'll invite you once more to check out our plans. We honestly work super hard on them to the point where calling them plans almost feels like a disservice. They're more like an online woodworking course or a video book, except that after you're finished with them, in addition to the knowledge and skills you'll build, instead of getting some crappy certificate, you get a table out of the deal. Also, if you like these videos and want to find out more about how you can support the channel, snag a t-shirt and a field notes booklet, and even discounts on our plans, check out the Patreon link in the description. And to all of my current and past Patreon supporters, I know I say it all the time, but thank you. Seriously. I couldn't do it without you. Alright, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.